Welcome to my channel. I'm Masood Raja, and in this brief video, I will offer my discussion of the first part of the Communist Manifesto. Now, as you might have noticed, I have made available on the channel the audio recordings of the Communist Manifesto in three parts. And in the first part, you probably already watched it, which discusses the bourgeois and the proletarians as two classes. And you can watch it up there. And I thought I should talk about it a little, uh, my understanding of it. So if you re-watch it carefully, you will see that in order to really understand the Communist Manifesto or generally Marx's work, we have to understand what Marx's idea of history is. And Marx's idea of history, and also Engels, who is a co-author in the manifesto, is that of an agonistic history. And what does it mean? Agonistic history in a way that historically, as they trace in the manifesto's first part, there are always, by and large, two competing groups in any given polity or society. There is always a dominant group and then there is a group of people who are in a subservient or oppressed condition. That's why they even use the term oppressors, right? And they trace the origin of this even in Rome, right? The, the, the patricians and Polybian divide. And then because of the pressure from below, what the patricians or the upper classes have to do is accommodate some of them in the system of power. So if you look at the Roman system, the Polybians had their own representatives eventually in the Roman Senate, right? And by pointing to this thing that the history of humankind is history of class struggle, what they are saying is that inherently in every mode of production there is always struggle between two classes. And thus, when we reach to what they call the bourgeois epoch, the rise of industrialism, and along with it, the rise of the bourgeoisie or the bourgeois class, it creates its other, which it absolutely needs, which is the proletariat, the workers, right? It tries to incorporate it within its own project, but eventually, towards the end of this section, we realize that the proletarians are also developing political consciousness. And the very means that constitute them as proletarians, the factory floor, becomes the place where they develop those lateral solidarities, form trade unions, form conglomerates who speak on the behalf of the interest of the workers, right? But these are the two competing classes in the bourgeois epoch, in the industrial age, right? Now, in their discussion of the bourgeoisie, they also tell us that this is a ruthless class. In its initial fight with the nobility, it has obliterated that opposition. But this is a class which is about capitalism, which is about industrialism, and it is voracious. It needs raw materials from wherever they are available. It needs people, workers, to convert those raw materials into commodities. It needs to sell those commodities, right? So the first one, acquisition of raw materials, then leads them to support colonization of other places of the world, right? The production forces them to keep coming up with more and more elaborate modes of production until the rise of the modern factory. And it also enables them to technologize it, use steam and other powers and modes of communication to enhance the productivity. But then it also forces them to have markets, keep captive markets or open markets so that they can sell their commodities. So as a class, this class must exploit the world at all levels of production, right? That's what they are trying to posit. In that process then, they absolutely then must have workers and hence they create an opposing class. This is the class which is pauperized, which is not paid heavily, and as they say in this part of the manifesto, which is set upon immediately by the bourgeois as soon as they get paid, the rent collector, right? 
the person they owe interest to, the small shopkeeper and all. But in this entire process, the proletarians are also then the lost hope because they're the only ones who can stem the tide of greed and this naked truth of money, right, as a class. Right? Now, this idea of these two competing classes actually is not necessarily original to Marx. If you read Adam Smith's chapter on labor, he already talks about it, that there are these two classes, right? The capitalists who own the mode of production and the workers. And he also theorizes how the workers have less means of resisting the dictates of the capitalists because they don't have much to fall back on. Right? So increasingly, as the profit increases, as industrialism increases, number of workers keep increasing. And since they have to compete each other for those jobs, right, their wages keep falling down. And this is what Marx and Engels are calling wage slavery. The modern instrument of oppression under industrial capital is this wage slavery. Towards the end, they give us some instances where the workers' collectives, trade unions, have lobbied for their interests, right? Right then, the 10-hour work law was being passed in the British Parliament. And that tells us that what they are telling us, that the proletarians as a class are a revolutionary class. And they are the only class which can stem the tide of bourgeois greed, but can also change the world to make it into a world in which everyone, and not just the capitalist bourgeois class, can live freely, reconciled with their own humanity. So these are some of the things that come clearly uh, across in the first part of the Communist Manifesto. Marx's agonistic view of history, history being as a history of class struggle, in that class struggle, there is always a dominant group and there is always an oppressed group. But the dominant group absolutely, in this case, needs the oppressed groups of workers. Its policies keep the workers divided and poor. right? But eventually, the workers, seeking their own interest, collectively as a group, become a class in themselves and start fighting for their rights. This fight the same communication system that enables the bourgeoisie to amass wealth is now possible for the workers too because they can create global alliances. Right? So where they are going in this section is for the proletariat to be not just a national class, but since they constitute a class which must sell its labor to make a living, and since there are millions of people under the bourgeois epoch, all over the world who are living in the same conditions of existence. Hence, the proletarians in the manifesto become a global class, connected, fighting for the same kind of rights. And that is the rise of the Communist Party, which cannot be national, which is global. So this is the first part of the manifesto. These are some of my limited thoughts on it. But here is another thing that we can do with it. We can take the claims that they are making within the context of the Com manifesto of the Communist Party and look at the labor capitalist relations right now. Even now, even though America has unions, right, the emphasis is, all, is always is to drive a wedge between the workers. So in America, race is used to do that, right? Uh, racialized identities make it impossible for workers to come together. In, during the times of Marx and after that, nationalism was what that cut across the global proletariat solidarities. Right? First World War was a tragic example of that, in which the members of the global proletariat, in the name of their nations, actually went and killed each other. But ultimately, the hint that we get in this section of the manifesto is that between, there is a struggle between these two classes, each seeking their own class interest. Both need each other, but the bourgeois absolutely need the proletariats. The bourgeois absolutely also need to keep them divided. But the natural tendencies of the workers becoming political, becoming united, developing organizations, 
already hints at the possibility that it is going to be the proletarians who are going to call the assumptions of the bourgeois epoch to question, right? And so that takes us to the beginning lines, the famous lines of the manifesto, the specter, a specter haunts Europe. Derrida has a wonderful discussion of that, on that term because specter is already something that is coming from the past, has gone beyond and is returning and it is the specter of Marxism, right? How did Marx use it? But partially you can read it as that it's being invoked by those who are feeling threatened that here is this menace rising up against us. So this section then gives us a clear understanding of the bourgeois class as absolutely voracious, as absolutely interested in arrogating to itself all the world's resources and absolutely committed to the productivity, overproduction of commodities and their export to the world, thus finding the markets. And since they have to produce commodities, they must have people, the proletarians, to exploit. And the profit, even what Adam Smith tells us, is always in how much labor can you extract from the workers. And then can the proletarians now constitute a class and pose a challenge, right? That we will learn in part two of the manifesto. So these are some of my cursory thoughts. I hope they are useful. Thank you so much for watching. And I will be back with a brief video about part two of the Communist Manifesto. Thank you so much. And as always, peace and love.